hat, that's not just a screaming crowd of college students. At Harvard, this is about the most anticipated, mysterious day of freshman year. One March morning, every spring, one envelope arrives at each freshman's doorstep. After opening it, literally horrifying. Um, Willa and I, who's my blockmate, we almost threw up. That's Kate Ravenscroft. Today on News Talk, the one Harvard tradition that gets at the heart of what it really means to be a Harvard student. From Plimpton Street, this is News Talk. I'm Frank So. The tradition? It's called Housing Day, and we called up two of the Crimson's reporters to tell us what it's all about. My name is Jay Sellers Hill, class of 2025. Uh, I am a senior news reporter, uh, and I cover the college administration beat. John N. Pena, class of 25. I cover House and Student Life. Thank you so much for joining us. So tell us what Housing Day is about in the first place. What is the tradition, and what are the component pieces? Yeah, so Housing Day is one of those just... I would say signature days that you kind of have to take part in as a Harvard student where freshmen um, who are living in the yard learn what upperclassmen house they're going to be in for the next three years. Uh, You know, they pick their blocking groups of, you know, one to eight people. um, And it's, you know, there's a lot of hype from the houses and the weeks leading up to it. Uh, So there's 12 houses of varying level of desirability. Um, and different identities, and uh, and the upperclassmen come to the yard, and they uh, receive some letters that they're going to deliver to freshmen, telling them which dorm they'll be in. Um, and uh, you go, and you find these freshmen in their dorm, and you knock on the door, and you deliver the letter, and usually you celebrate with them. And uh, typically, everyone kind of gathers in the yard afterward, celebrate. I've tried two essays. I'm skipping two classes. Here we are talking to Maya Bodnick. And I am going to Mather for dinner. Here's Christopher Ruiz. Uh, I'm going to, I have a midterm in about two hours, which I still have to study for. So So yeah, I kind of think of it as this like second official welcoming to Harvard. At least that's how it felt for me as a freshman that, you know, until you have a house assignment, you're not really a Harvard student, right? Because you'll, you'll meet alumni and their first question is what house are you in, right? You'll say, oh, you go to Harvard, what house, right? Um, So until I had a house identity, I didn't feel quite like I was like fully integrated yet. Take us to the morning of housing day. You're a reporter or you're a student walking out uh, of your dorm at like 7.30, right, into the yard. What would you see there? When you're making your way to the yard, you're seeing all people from all houses, like, decked out in house colors. And some people go really crazy with it. I saw someone, like, literally dressed as the bell tower from Lowell, which was super cool. Like, shout out to her for, for being so committed to it. And then from the dorm storming perspective, which was new to me this year, it's, uh, like I said, you're tired, but also it's really cool to get to the yard. All of that's happening. It's super awesome. But then to, like, knock on people's doors and, like, see how happy they are to, you know, is is is, is really cool. Like, just making people so happy just because you're there. They don't even know who you are, but you're they know where you're from, and, and that's pretty cool. I mean, you mentioned this gets out a little bit. There's, like, a hierarchy of desirability here, right? Most people consider the Nine River Houses, um, which are closest to Harvard Yard, to be more desirable than the three quad houses, um, which are just a little bit further from the yard, and they're kind of uh, in a different direction. So freshmen tend to hope to want a river house. I'll admit that was my kind of reasoning when I was a freshman. You'll hear a lot of people say, We were so happy. Like, all, all of these quad groups came up the stairs. Here we are talking to Adelaide Parker, who's a magazine editor at the Crimson. And we were really worried that we were going to get quadded. And then the Mather group came to our door, and they were chanting FOHO, and we were terrified. Oh, as long as it's a river house, like I'll, I'll be fine. I will say, I think that kind of takes the heat off of some not as high quality river houses, not the people in them, but there's this idea that the housing in the river is just in general higher quality than the housing in the quad. That's definitely not true. You're going to find various vermin and broken things and whatever. It, it happens in the river. There are some river houses where you're going to, we're not going to have the best housing, but there's just kind of this narrative that if you're in the river, you're good. If you're in the quad, it's, you've been unlucky. Generally, you're fearing that it's going to be the quad. So Cabot is one of those houses. Uh, so if people are yelling Cabot at your door, might not be a good sign. Uh, at least that's the traditional view on things. And, I mean, students really take that to heart. The night before housing day, we have the river run. Late on Wednesday evening, students gather in packs to run around every house, get in, take a shot, and book it to the next house for their next shot. 
Traditionally, students do shots at river houses to try to get good luck and avoid the quad. But today, some people run to all 12 houses, take all 12 shots. Yes, yes, we did. Here's Chris Ruano, Siddharth Twari, Jack Holland, and Hansa Lossary. Does it work? Our because favorite. Elliot, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Elliot sorry. is the one house. We jumped over a fence, climbed through a window, and we went up five flights of stairs for our shot. And after we were done, we climbed the Elliot tree and took a photo on a disposable camera. And that is why we got Elliot today. I firmly believe it. Yeah, there's not a more fitting house for us after we're here. It was our favorite stop. Our favorite it was our favorite stop, stop without a doubt. Yeah. What was interesting was kind of the like like i said before this immediate confirmation that you hear from people of like i knew it right like i think our brains really rush to like find correlation between things um so a lot of people were coming up with some crazy idea that 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 they got a certain house and it was half a joke but also kind of not so people would say oh last night i went to adams twice and that's why i got adams because i actually had to go back to to, to get something I'm pretty Happy. Quincy was the hardest to get into. Here's Summer Tan. Did get separated from everyone else and like locked out for 30 minutes. But I got in eventually and I think that's why we got it. I'm very excited. Last night, last night yes. Um, I did have to go like hide behind a fire escape for a couple, a couple 20 minutes. Oh, I had a dream and it had an elephant in it. And, and th that's why I got Elliot because they're the elephants. Um, like almost everyone I talked to had some reason that they know they got the house, even though we all know, like we're all logical people. We all know how this works. It's a computer that they, you know, plug our names into and the computer runs in about 15 seconds and comes up with everyone's assignments. Um, and I think it was fun that everyone kind of suspended their, you know, really critical academic thinking. Um, and it kind of became Christmas again, where you kind of believe in Santa. You're like, oh, because I did this, like, that's why it happened. Like, that's why I got the river house. Uh, one thing I will say is like the rivalry between houses isn't, um, you know, on housing day, it seems like every house hates the other house because, you know, you want freshmen to be excited about yours on every other day besides housing day. The rivalries aren't, you know, super crazy. I spend time in a lot of other houses um, and a lot of people eat in different dining halls, stuff like that. For the most part, for most of the time, everyone's welcome into different spaces of the houses, which is another really cool thing about it because you have your house identity, you have your house pride, uh, but you also have friends in other houses. Harvard uh, identity doesn't go away just because you're into, uh, you get sorted into the houses. Like you still have your friends in other houses and um, can can do things with them. A lot of the a lot of the upperclassmen, you know. Most people on this campus have only seen Housing Day either virtually or last year, which was still a little bit weird. There were still some restrictions, although I'm not sure they were really followed. But there were technically dorm storm restrictions last year. And this is the first year where it has been really like do it however you want to do it and in giving students the freedom to hold whatever events they want to hold um, following kind of the lifting of COVID restrictions. And, you know, it's weird that like, COVID was, you know, three years ago, right? And this is a lot of people's kind of first experience with, a, with like these pre-COVID traditions. And I think I was really heartened to see that they have not, I don't think so, like really suffered after that. I, it's, it's kind of fun to see them come back into hopefully what they were like before. And I think people were surprised of like how awesome it was. Like people were really, you know, people were really pumped upperclassmen as well. Um, and a little jealous because you, you know, you, you kind of want to relive it uh, just a little bit. I, I remember, like, I was a little envious. It's, it's an exciting day for, for the freshmen. Yeah. I mean, as a freshman, too, walking into Annenberg on the morning of housing day, I've never seen lines that long. Like, oh. they, were, they were long out the door, mm -hmm. right? Um, and this, this was, like, it's not just, like, a tourist group or two that's coming through and trying to see Annenberg. This is the entire freshman class, mm -hmm. like, super excited for housing day. Being in a space that they're so familiar with, but with so much novelty, as you said. Yeah. With the way that you were describing it, right? Like, oh, what did you get? What did you get? It really does feel like Christmas Day. It really does yeah. feel like Santa. Um, so I, I'm curious then if there are any particular moments for you that feel like, oh, this is what makes Housing Day special. Mm -hmm. And this is what we're all living for here. I think one thing that I really enjoy about it is I think there just aren't comparable things at, at other places. I mean... Even Harvard Yale, right? When, when I think about what is the most iconic event that we do as Harvard college students, Harvard Yale's great, but most schools have a big game, 
right? I'm I'm from North Carolina. I remember every time that Duke and UNC face off, it's a it's a big deal. Um, so they have their big game. Uh, most schools have a rival in football. Most schools have different rivals. The idea that there's a big game coming up and everyone goes out and tailgates and goes to the game is really fun, but it's not that unique to Harvard, right? And I think what's really cool about housing day is we do housing in a really unique way. Um, you know, other other schools that have a residential college system, usually you get assigned your freshman like right as you come in as a freshman, right? So typically you live in your residential college immediately from the start. And I think what's really fun with the way Harvard does it is you know all of these people, you know, know all of these other freshmen, and you've had time to acclimate, and then they kind of drop the housing assignment on you. And it's just like not something that I'm aware of really, really happens other places. So there's this kind of like real sense of privilege of like I get to be part of this really unique tradition. And tradition's really, the, I mean, everything is so much tradition. Like, you know, we were talking about how we don't really know why it happens like this or like there are things that we can't really explain. Like I've tried looking them up. There are parts of housing day where you're just like, yeah, I don't really know how that got started. It's just, it's Harvard is a place that is always steeped in tradition. There are so many traditions here um, for, you know, it's, it's so old that there's going to be a lot of traditions and it, it always just feels a little bit like you're sharing that with people who have taken part in the past. Like all the, you know, thousands and thousands of Harvard students who have done this before you, um, you feel like there's this real, like, solidarity there. Next, Boston's new night czar, and how Boston's nightlife may or may not be in for a change. This just might sound like a city bustling and alive, but beneath the specter of Boston nightlife is a more complicated and less rosy story. With the COVID-19 pandemic, Boston's economy took a huge hit. And while much of the city has rebounded, its nightlife hasn't. Boston Mayor Michelle Wu recently appointed Korean Reynolds as the city's first ever director of nightlife economy. Now, Boston residents are left to ask, will she be able to revive it? Today, Boston's new night czar and how Boston's nightlife may or may not be in for a change. My name is Dylan Fan, and I am a reporter for Government Relations. I'm Jack Trapanik. I'm his co-writer, so I also am on the Government Relations beat. Jack and Dylan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So this new job comes with a new title, Director of Nightlife Economy. Tell us about the story behind this appointment. Perian Reynolds, who was appointed by Mayor Wu, will be the first person to ever have this position, the director of nightlife economy. And it's part of uh, the Wu administration's uh, plan to help the city's economy come back from the challenges uh, from the pandemic, especially for you know businesses. Reynolds' position falls under the Office of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion. So the idea is not just that, okay, she's helping improve Boston's nightlife, but really that she's like part of this broader response after the pandemic, this national way of like considering the the next normal after the pandemic, you know, this idea that like, okay, we're not just returning to normal, but we're doing so in a way that's like improved and better. And so she's focusing not literally just on expanding or improving Boston's nightlife, but making it more accessible or affordable um, how she can or promoting more events in Boston's neighborhoods as opposed to just its downtown. So tell us a bit about Boston's nightlife right now. What are the biggest problems and what leaves more to be desired? Boston is like a college town. There are a lot of universities, a lot of college students, a lot of young people who want to go out into the city and, you know, go to nightclubs and bars and have fun, right? But some of the problems that, you know, specifically affect them are lack of public transit options. MBTA, they shut down after 1 a.m. And, you know, a lot of people would say that that's like the, like, about like the prime time to be you know at a nightclub and at a bar and because of that people have to try to find another way home you know usually that ends up being like an uber right but that can be really expensive especially for a college student who you know has a budget you know when they go out mass state law forbids the sale of alcohol after 2 a.m which you know for again a big city is kind of the time you're out and clubbing you know it's saturday night you know new york and chicago for example they can sell alcohol till 4 a.m. And even then there's some laxity around like kind of going a little bit until 4.30 or in that sort of thing. Boston, you know, not at all like that. Another problem is, you know, high uh, cover charges to even enter a bar, you know, in 
uh, from what we've heard from other students, they they're much higher, you know, in Boston compared to some other cities that can, um, you know, you know, limit people's ability to participate in nighttime activities. You know, I talked to this one bar owner who's a longtime bar owner in Boston, but originally came from New York and said when he first came here, he thought it was like a provincial city is what he said. Like, you know, in New York, oh, we ate dinner at 11, went out and, you know, we're out until four. But here, very different. Um, So if you really, if you go online and you Google, I'm, you know, you'll be hard pressed to find a club in Boston that's actually open after 2 a.m. Um, and, you know, similarly, the city just has a reputation for being kind of Puritan, you know, because of its history. That's the kind of the connection that people make to it. But, you know, in Mass in general, happy hour is illegal. And there are a lot of smaller things, too, that you'll pick up on. You know, if you're going to, like, a liquor store and you're trying to buy liquor, you need a mass driver's license. So if you have, like, one from even, you know, Rhode Island, they technically they don't have to accept it, which is not the case in every state. So generally, the idea is just much stricter to be here. Boston's famously a college town, as you mentioned. What's in for Boston students? What can they expect from this change? The main thing is uncertainty and skepticism because her role is primarily just uh, providing recommendations or policies to the Wu administration. It's not exactly clear like how much impact or how much direct impact that the Night Czar or you know Curry and Reynolds uh, will actually put into you know legislation. So. You know, I think right now, like a lot of pro- the problems that college students see, there's still a lot of skepticism. So at the heart of this are Boston's residents. They might not wake up tomorrow morning to find Boston's nightlife completely transformed. But what can they expect from this change? You know, the focus of this night czar is really is like, you know, there's two parts. So the first is like downtown has had like a very different like post lockdown recovery process. It's been way slower. The example given in a Boston Globe investigation that was kind of talking about all these workers who down which downtown was very dependent on white collar workers who come in at, you know five days a week and maybe linger Fridays afterward to stay out with friends or whatever. Well now you know you can work from home and a lot of people are. So T ridership is still not where it used to be. And, um, you know, some of these businesses kind of struggling. Um, So, you know, that's like the first half, really, of like what she's focusing on. And then the other half is neighborhoods themselves, which highlighting night businesses, you know, going to more community bars, maybe bringing Michelle Wu along with her, who you wouldn't normally see there as like, you know, kind of a mom of two young children. Realistically, what can we expect to see from Director Reynolds in the next few months? One thing that Reynolds said is, you know, we want to bring more of Boston downtown. Which is like, you know, I think, okay, to a Harvard student, Boston is downtown. Like, they see it's the place with the skyscrapers and, like, you know, the very dense urban environment. And, you know, for locals, the vast majority of Bostonians do not live in Back Bay and North End, you know, around Newberry Street. Um, They live in the neighborhoods, which is farther out, you know, in East Boston or South Boston or Hyde Park, you know, places that are take some time to get into the city, but are also much more residential, much more local. So when she says she wants to bring more of Boston downtown, for me, that really says she's looking at like these small businesses with a little bit more local character. Unfortunately, like as nice as it is that she might be promoting a few more like community level events, um, she doesn't have the power to change these really like systemic problems, which you wouldn't expect. And even if she did, of course, you know, the, you know, one night czar is not going to like transform the fact that Boston is suffering from like a crisis of public transportation, you know, crisis of like, you know, cost of living and that sort of thing that like bleeds over into its nightlife and affordability. So the impact will be sort of muted for sure. In the short term, I think that the most important thing is that there's there's becoming more publicity around, you know, these issues that affect the nightlife. Like the fact that the Wu administration, you know, actually created this position and appointed someone to it shows, uh, you know, sets this precedent for the future that, you know, nightlife is important to Boston. Newstalk is hosted by Frank S. Zhou. Our producers are Gina H. Cho and Frank S. Zhou. Our multimedia chairs are Joey Huang and Julian J. Giordano. Our managing editor is Brandon L. Kingdollar. Music in this episode comes from freesound.org. From 14 Plimpton Street, this is News Talk.